what evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> the thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The old saying, better be safe than sorry, certainly applies today in the matter of heating your home. If your coal bin isn't already filled at the top, call your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer and have him attend to the matter right now. Blue coal, you know, is the quality home fuel of low cost. It will give you even dependable heat at all times. Yes, and it's a wise move to have your bin full of blue coal clear to the top. These are uncertain times, and it's best to be safe. Don't gamble with the health of your family. Remember, a warm house is a healthy house. So get in touch with your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and powerful secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... The Case of the Three Frightened Policemen. Why fool around? You got to get up early in the morning to put one over on Jerry Rowan. I got you right where I want you. Now you take your orders from me or... Stop that walking up and down. You make me nervous. Well, what's your answer going to be? You going to pay your little gambling debt to Jerry Rowan? Are you? <laughs> Now listen. Listen to me. It's all right. Don't come any closer. Stay from me. You can't kill Jerry Rowan. What time is Commissioner Weston's plane getting in, Lamar? Well, according On to. On stop the... flight 36, arriving from Washington at gate 6. <laughs> there you are, Margot. You see how efficient the airlines are? They even answer your questions for you. <laughs> Gate six is up this way. Do you think Commissioner Weston's going to be difficult to persuade? Well, you know him as well as I do, Margot. But he'll never forgive you for sending that telegram with my name on it. Oh, here we are. Gate six. Yeah. And that would be the commissioner's plane. Flight 22 from Chicago, arriving at gate three. Look, Lamont, there's the Chicago plane coming in, too. Don't they come in fast, though? Mm-hmm. Oh, Lamont, look. What are you staring at, Margot? You act like you've never seen a plane before. Well, I'm not looking at the plane, Lamont. I was looking at that man over there at gate three. Isn't he the man who we heard asking for Commissioner Weston? Where? Oh, yes. So it is. Well, we ought to tell him he's waiting at the wrong gate for the commissioner. He'll probably discover his mistake before we could get to him, Margot. Oh, there you are, Cranston, Miss Lane. Hello, Commissioner. Did you have a nice trip? No, thanks. I just had one. <laughs> oh, Commissioner, that's an old gag. Well, it's not as old as that telegram gag you sent me, Cranston. Come immediately. Very important. What did you mean by that? What did you mean by that? <laughs> it was Margot's idea. She sent it. Margot sent the oh, wire. Commissioner, you know that I belong to the Social Welfare Association. Now, what has that got to do with it? Well, I promised that I'd get you to speak on crime prevention. It's cause and cure. What? Curing crime prevention? <laughs> I don't blame you, Commissioner. It sounds a little mad to me, too. A speech on crime prevention. Oh, well, please say you'll do it. I gave my solemn promise well, that you'd be there. Well, this is the limit of and all I the nonsense. You're making a mistake. I'm not Tom Vito. Aren't you? What's oh. that over there? Well, if you're not Vito, you can prove it later at headquarters. There seems to be some I'm trouble, sorry. Commissioner. Yes, it does. Why, that's the man who was looking for you, Commissioner. Looking for me, huh? Oh, he's just picked up someone. All right, folks, stand back there. Let me prove. Well, don't mind me, please. Make way there, please. Let me in there. Yes, please. Uh, you can't do this to me. What's going on I can't here? do this. Oh, Commissioner Weston. I just picked this guy up coming in from Chicago. Fine. Who is he? Incidentally, who are you? Detective Sloan of the Detroit Force. And this is the murderer of the gambler, Jerry Rowan. His name is Tom Vitor. I'm not Vitor. Commissioner, look at this photograph in this police circular. Is this Vitor? It's just a similarity, I tell you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Similarity, huh? 
Come on, Vidar. We're going down to headquarters. Let us through here, please. Commissioner, wait! Commissioner, I've got to talk to you. Come on, Vidar. But the social welfare is going to... Oh, Don. What's the matter, Margo? Did the Social Welfare Association lose its principal speaker? Not yet, it hasn't. I'm going to follow Commissioner Weston right to police headquarters and get him to say that he will speak tomorrow night. Fingerprints don't lie, Vitor. Ready to confess now? Why did you kill Gambler Rowan? I didn't kill Rowan. But you do admit you are Vitor. That you broke your parole and flew to Chicago after you'd murdered Rowan? All right, I broke my parole. I flew to Chicago, but I didn't murder Rowan. I'd like to ask Vitor a few questions if I may, Commissioner Weston. Now, Cranston, Detective Sloan and I can handle this. Oh, Commissioner, I just thought of something. What, Miss Lane? What now? You could use all this as a subject of your talk tomorrow night before the Social Welfare Association. Sloan, take Vita into the other office. This small talk must be boring to him. Right, Commissioner. Come on, Vitor. In. I'm sorry, Max. Ah, well, another case solved to the department's credit. Who? Vitor? Who else? He was the last man who saw Rowan alive. Now, look, Commissioner. I know, I know, Cranston. Yes, indeed. You're going to ask about fingerprints. <laughs> Well, we found Vita's prints all over Rowan's apartment. Very good, Commissioner. Huh? But uh, I was going to ask why Vitor broke his parole to fly to Chicago. Very good, Cranston. He simply wanted to get away. Then why did he come back? Also very good. What? Granted, he had killed Rowan and gotten away. Why should he want to come back here? Yes, Commissioner. Why didn't he stay in Chicago? Now, please, Miss Lane. And this police circular is a very curious thing, Commissioner. What do you mean, Cranston? What's wrong with it? Pardon me, Commissioner, but I think Vitor is about ready to talk now. Oh, good. Well, I'll go right in and see him. <laughs> see you later, Cranston. But, Commissioner... Miss Lane, come on. But, on. Commissioner, I want to... <laughs> I like him. Oh, well. Now, what were you going to say about that police circular, Lamont? Now, look at it, Margot. Wouldn't you think it strange that a police circular from Chicago would have been printed here? Why, yes. Look, here's the printer's trademark. Well, what does it mean, Lamont? It means, Margot, that Tom Vitor is going to receive a little visit from the shadow. <laughs> What's that? I heard a voice. It is the voice of the shadow, Tom Vitor. I can't see you. I'm right here outside your cell door. I've cast a hypnotic mist over your mind, which makes me invisible. I've heard of you, Shadow. You've got to help me. I didn't kill Jerry Rowan. Why did you leave town the same day Rowan was murdered? I didn't know anything about Rowan's murder, Shadow. But you had been to Rowan's apartment that afternoon. Yes, Rowan had sent for me. He wanted me to join the mob again, but I refused. That was the last I saw of him. And yet that same evening, Mr. Vitor, you violated your parole by flying to Chicago. Well, when I got back to my apartment, there was a message telling me that my wife was there. She left me. I had to tell her that I was gone straight for her sake. So that's why you went to Chicago? Yes, to ask her to give me another chance. I see. Then why did you come back, Mr. Vitor? I couldn't find her in Chicago. Then I received another tip that she'd come back here and was staying at the Carlson Hotel with her friend Elsie Randley. What you've told me, Mr. Vitor, wouldn't stand a chance in a court of law. Court or no court, it's true. We shall see, Mr. Vitor. We shall see. Lamont, did you find anything out from Vitor? I don't know yet, Margot. Oh, uh, by the way... Where's Shrevey? He's waiting in his cab around the corner. Well, let's find him. All right. Oh, I'm getting hungry, Lamont. Do you think you could possibly buy a poor little starving social worker some dinner? Well, I shall buy a poor little starving social worker a big dinner. Oh, Lamont. Later. Oh, Lamont. Right now, the shadow is going to call on Mrs. Tom Vitor and her friend Elsie Randley at the Carlson Hotel. Oh, well, then we could have dinner there, couldn't we, Lamont? Oh, <laughs> Yes. We could. Later. Oh, Lamont! Down, Margo. They're firing at us. Oh, we can get off the street now, Lamont. Looks like the shooting's over. Lamont. Lamont! 
Well, he's been hit. What's the matter, lady? Get a doctor quickly. He's been shot. Cranston, you had a very narrow escape. A fraction of an inch to the right and... Uh, thanks, doctor. I fully realize how close it was. Can I help you, Lamont? Doggone it, Cranston. This only goes to prove what I've always said. Amateurs shouldn't meddle in police work. <laughs> now, you leave him alone, Commissioner. Can't you see he's still weak? What were you doing outside police headquarters in the middle of a gunfight anyway? Uh, Commissioner, I wasn't in the middle of a gunfight. I was the target. And if you ask any more questions, you're going to be my target, please, Commissioner. Please, Who's out for you, Cranston? I have a hunch it's got something to do with Tom Vito and the Rowan murder. So Vito shot at you, huh? We've got him under lock and key. No, it wasn't Vito who took a shot at now, me. Now, look here, Cranston. Vito is the killer, and that's that. Let's Commissioner, not confuse... Commissioner, Commissioner. What? what is it, Sloan? Vito has hanged himself from a water pipe in his cell. Hanged what? himself? No. Such a thing is impossible. Well, I'm telling you, Commissioner... Hey, just a moment. Then it would appear Vito took his own life? Obviously. Oh, yes, that's right. His only out was to cheat the chair. Well, gentlemen... If Vito committed suicide, we have a horse here of a decidedly different color. In a moment, our play will continue. Meanwhile, let's leave the world of the mysterious and hop right into the sphere of everyday affairs. There's certainly nothing that's more an everyday affair than heating your home in the winter. Every day in the long winter months, you want dependable, even heat throughout your house. Blue coal will give it to you. Blue coal is a dependable fuel of low cost because it burns better, lasts longer, and that means real economy. What's more, blue coal makes comfortable home heating not only simple and economical, but also easy. Right, easy is just the word. You see, blue coal is delivered to your home in exactly the right size for your heating plant. Then, too, the new automatic blue coal heat regulator cuts out those frequent damper-adjusting trips you're probably familiar with. Cuts them right out because it automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace and keeps every room at an even temperature. Get in touch with your reliable neighborhood blue coal dealer right away. Ask him to come out and discuss your heating situation with you. You'll find him a genial, well-informed businessman. A number of people impressed by this have told us Blue coal is represented by an especially fine group of men. This is true, and something every dealer is proud of. So look under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory and call your neighborhood dealer tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane, it's already three o'clock in the morning, it's already. Don't you think it's advisable that we should all go home and get a little shut-eye we should get? <laughs> Perhaps we ought to take Miss Lane home, Shreve. She's sound asleep here in the back seat. No, I'm not. I'm wide awake. I just close my eyes to rest them. <laughs> okay, Margo, have it your way. On to 6078 Front Street, Shreve. Yes, sir. Mine is not the reason why... That's the Mine city morgue, Shreve. It's just a door died. Morgue? Watch where you're driving, Shrevey. As if I wouldn't from now on, as if. <laughs> Why the morgue, Lamont? Because I can't believe, as Commissioner Weston does, that Vitor committed suicide. I want to see the body myself. I don't like to bring it up, but this is 6078 Front Street. The morgue, remember? <laughs> Very well, Shrevey. Oh, and Margot, I, uh, I think you'd better stay here and guard Shrevey. He's a little green around the gills. Oh, Lamont. Oh, yes, Miss Lane, around the gills, but not a little. Oh, Shrevey, <laughs> you're a big baby. I won't be long, Margo. Well, see that you aren't, Lamont. Ah, what can I do for you, young man? If you're looking for a room and bath, I can't accommodate you. You ain't the right type. Very funny. <laughs> I think so. Room and bath, right type. Get it? <laughs> I'd like to see the body of Tom Vitor, which was brought in here earlier this evening. Oh, Tom Vitor, huh? Let's see. I would like to see the body, please. Now, don't be impatient, young man. He'll wait for you. Get it? <laughs> He'll wait for you. I get it. Now, will you please take <laughs> me to the body? Oh. <clears throat> no sense of humor. All right, right this way. 
Don't be surprised if he don't recognize you because he... Oh, no, you wouldn't appreciate it. Yes, here we are. Yeah, let me see. All right, step in. Thanks. Now, let me see. I think we have your friend packed way up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's your friend, Mr. Tuck, neatly away on his little trundle bed of ice. You want to look? Yes. Uh, just as I thought. What? This man didn't die of hanging. Death caused by strangulation at his own hands, it says here. I don't care what it says there. He didn't commit suicide. Tom Vito met his death just as Jerry Rowan did, by murder. Did you learn anything at the morgue, Lamont? Enough, Margo, to know that the shadow's next step is to have Mrs. Tom Vito identify her husband's photograph, which appears on this forged police circular. Hello? Hello? Oh, uh, all right, operator. I'll call later. <laughs> oh. Whom were you calling on the phone, Mrs. Vitor? What? I thought I heard a voice. It is the shadow's voice, Mrs. Vitor. Who are you? I, I can't see you. I've clouded your mind with a hypnotic mist, making me invisible to your eyes. Oh, uh, I see but why have you come here, Shadow? Because I know that you can tie up several loose ends of a mystery. And I don't know how I can help. You can help by telling me who you were trying to reach on the telephone just now. Why, uh, it was Elsie Randley, my, my roommate. Uh, she's staying with me here. She hasn't returned home and I, I just got worried. I see. Look at the picture on this police circular, Mrs. Victor. Why, it's Tom, my husband. Have you ever seen this particular photograph before? Why, uh, yes, I... I took it about five years ago. Before you decided to divorce your husband, Mrs. Vitor? You know that, too? I do. Why did you run away, Mrs. Vitor? Well, uh, my love for Tom had died. And, and you fell in love with somebody else? Yes. Why didn't you explain everything to your husband? Oh, I wanted to, Shadow, but I, I was persuaded not to. I'll go to him now. He'll understand. No, Mrs. Vitor. It's too late now. Too late? Your husband is dead. Oh, no. No. Your husband was murdered. Tom was... Murdered, Mrs. Vitor. And you can help me catch his murderer by telling me who could have obtained the photograph which appears in this forged police circular. Yes. Yes, Shadow, the only person who could have stolen that picture for me is... Oh! Mrs. Vitor! Oh. Mrs. Vitor! <laughs> I knew he'd do this. His very determined shadow. Who, Mrs. Vitor? Who has done this? I can't tell now, shadow. Because it haunt me even after death. Even after death. So, Commissioner... You think at last you have the real murderer under lock and key. Who else could it be but Elsie Randley? After all, Mr. Cranston, she was Mrs. Vita's roommate, and besides, she had good reason to kill her. Really? What reason, Cranston? Try to follow. Elsie Randley killed Mrs. Vita because... Commissioner Weston? Yes? I'm Lieutenant Destro of the Chicago Detective Bureau. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? A little explaining. Why did you pick up Tom Vito for the murder of Jerry Rowan? Because his police circular demanding his arrest was sent out by your office. That circular was forged. What? Just what I was trying to tell you, Commissioner. The real murderer was trying to throw suspicion on Tom Vitor. Well, so what? The murderer is Elsie Randley, and I've got her in the state prison. You think so, Commissioner? Sure. She killed Rowan because he gave her the brush off. She used to be his girlfriend. Then she killed Mrs. Vitor because she was afraid Mrs. Vitor would spill it to the police. Simple enough. There's just one little point you gentlemen seem to have overlooked. Now uh, what? Who killed Tom Vitor? He killed himself. Commissioner... Tom Vito was beaten to death in the same way that Rowan was. What? It was a very professional job. You couldn't tell his head had been bashed in unless you examined it very carefully. I saw his body in the morgue. Cranston, I tell you, Elsie Randley is the killer, and I'm sticking to it. What do you think, Sloan? That's the way I figure it, Chief. Uh, how do you feel about it, Destro? Sounds logical to me. Uh-huh. All sticking your necks out together, eh? Well, Commissioner, if anything happens to Miss Elsie Randley, your so-called killer... You're going to be three frightened policemen. Lamont, 
Are you sure that Elsie Randley is completely innocent? Margot, I think she's innocent, but I have reason to believe she knows the name of the murderer. And because of this knowledge, he'll try to silence her, too. But she's perfectly safe. She's locked up. That didn't save Tom Vito, Margot. We've got to protect her. Now, look, I want you to go to the state prison and get to Elsie Randley's cell while I trail Detective Destro. I don't care how you get to her cell, but do it. Her life depends on it. Here we are, Miss Lane. Elsie Randley's cell. Oh, it's dark in here at this time of night. Yes. Oh, now, before we go in, I must warn you again that neither the warden nor Commissioner Weston know that I'm letting you see Miss Randley. It would mean my job if they did. Oh, I understand, Detective Sloan. Uh, go in, please. Thank you. Who's your friend, Detective? Miss Randley, meet Miss Lane. You two are going to be together a long time. What do you mean? I'm getting sick of this whole thing, Sloan. I don't want to go to the chair for... Somebody else? Well, then tell us who the real murderer is, Miss Randley. Don't shield a killer. I don't squeal, sister. But you will, Elsie. Oh, no, I won't. I gave my promise. You'll break your promise, Elsie, when the electric chair stares you in the face. Oh, he's right, Miss Randley. Tell the police what you know. Yes, Elsie, tell. You can tell Miss Lane everything. Are you kidding? <laughs> Elsie is trying to say that I'm the killer, Miss Lane. You're the killer? Yes, I killed Rowan because I owed him a gambling debt and couldn't pay it. What? So I sent Vitor to Chicago on a wild goose chase to find his wife. That way, I pinned the murder on him. Are you crazy? Spilling that Sloan? But the police circular. I had the phony circular made up in order to grab him when he got off the plane. You know, I'm proud of the fact that when I beat him to death in this very room and hanged him from that water pipe, that none of the smart cops knew how it was done. You must have killed Mrs. Vitor, too. <laughs> Mrs. Vitor made a very useful tool until she outlived her usefulness and wanted to squeal to the police. But enough of that. I have a score to settle with you two now. Now, wait, Joe. You, you can't do this. You won't have to watch long, Elsie. You're going to die first, Miss Lane. Now, we just open this door here to the death chamber. Well, that... That's the electric chair in there. Slow, you can't do this. No, help! Help! Oh, no, Stay my one, Miss Lane. We're quite alone here. No one will hear you. What are you going to do? Aren't you both rather impatient? Mr. Cranston will stop you. He'll... I promise my shots won't miss that meddler the second time. And now, Miss Lane, into the electric chair you go. Oh, no! Oh, yes. No. Yes. No. yes. No. yes. No. There. There, now. Let now to go. tie the straps. Oh, no, you don't, Sloan. Think up behind me, will you? you... I don't yes. think so. Oh. <laughs> Too bad, Miss Lane, that I'm your only audience now. That I'll be a very appreciative one. And now to pull the switch. It generates a little power. Oh, no. No, please. Please, please. No, please. <laughs> and this no. little switch will complete the job. No. Dead so soon, my dear. You spoiled my fun. I didn't even pull the switch. Well, a little extra juice won't hurt you. I just have to... Not so fast, Detective Sloan. My voice, my arm. Who holds my arm? <laughs> The shadow murderer. What have you done to Miss Lane? Something that even you can't mend, Shadow. Sloan, your life of crime is at an end. If it is, I won't pay the police for the deaths of Roan and the Vitors and above all, Miss Lane. The privilege of taking my own life rests with me. Get away from that master switch. Thanks, no, Shadow. I'd rather go this way. Ah! Thank heaven, Margot. When you fainted, Sloan thought you were dead and didn't complete his job. Yes, thank heaven, Lamont. I'll never forgive myself for sending you to that trap when I was stupidly following the trail of Detective Destro. He was perfectly all right? Perfectly. It was Sloan who had no right to wear a badge. He'd gotten on the Detroit force with the aid of false credentials. Sooner or later, he would have been discovered, but now his days of killing are over. Oh, Lamont, I just thought of something. What? I got a call from the Social Service League again this morning, and they're holding another meeting. Oh, good for them. Hmm, they want to know why I didn't get Commissioner Weston to speak to them the last time. Uh-huh. On crime prevention, its cause and cure? Yes. So I told them I was getting someone else, someone better. <laughs> Who's the poor goat this time, Margot? <laughs> I told them I was getting you. Well, that's... 
Oh, no, you're not, Margot. Oh, yes, I am, Lamont. <laughs> In a moment, we'll bring you a real-life episode proving that crime does not pay. First, I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing from Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, John Barclay. Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, quite a few people have told me that they're tired of playing nursemaid to their furnace. I wonder if you feel the same way. You must if you find it necessary to hop down to the basement several times a day to fuss and fool around with the furnace adjust the dampers, and try to wheedle a good supply of heat out of a lazy fire. Now, all that's unnecessary. It certainly is. Actually, when you know the correct method of operating a furnace, the whole thing is perfectly easy. Now, here's my suggestion. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer and ask him to send a John Barkley-trained serviceman to your home right away. This man will teach you correct furnace operation in a jiffy, and at absolutely no charge. It won't cost you a cent, and you need feel under no obligation. Homeowners the country over are making use of this free and exclusive blue coal dealer service. So, why don't you? Decide right now to call your blue coal dealer tomorrow. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. You'll find it pays to get acquainted with the blue coal way. Thank you. Characters' names, places, and plot in today's story are purely fictitious, and any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Direct from real life, we now bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. It is 4 p.m. November 7th. Anthony Tyson, 26, leader of a holdup gang, is on his way to a meeting of the mob. He says to himself... So the cops think they know something, do they? They put out posters. Wanted for robbery. <laughs> hey, I to make that plural. We got 30 jobs in the book. Yeah, and they ain't gonna never stick me in no stir. Say, who's this guy coming down the street? Looks like a cop. No, no, he don't. Now, here's a house. Right through that plate glass window. He's coming after me. He's a cop, all right. Well, I'll go through the house and out the back door. Think you can get away so easily, Anthony Tyson? No, indeed. The law will follow a criminal to the ends of the earth. I gotta get out of here. He's gonna catch me. I'm going through this window. So, sprawled out and dying with a bullet in his back, another gangster criminal wrote finish to a brief career of law defiance. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, the DL and W Coal Company, producers of Blue Coal, bring you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood Blue Coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal.